Next up, we have David Poston. He is the leader of the Compact Fission Reactor Design Team at Los Alamos National Laboratory. His team is responsible for the design and development of nuclear fission reactors for civilian, NASA, and defense applications in, in space. Dr. Poston is the chief reactor designer for the NASA Kilopower Project. Welcome, Dr. Poston. Super happy to be here. Uh, I was with uh, the Robert at the inaugural Mars Society Convention, and I, back then we thought by now we'd be on Mars and have nuclear thermal rockets flying around and everything, but uh, uh, it's really exciting to report that, uh, that we have finally taken a step towards fission power in space. This is actually the first conference I've talked at. We don't have all the results totally compiled, but, uh, but I'm going to show you some of that and more about what we're doing. Uh, what are we at here? He's, oh, he's, he's still checking it out. Uh, uh, let you know a little bit about um, what, what, uh, what, what the program is looking like now, because that, that wasn't really part of the, part of the plan. But the, uh, the, right now, NASA is pretty serious about uh, putting a landing in a reactor somewhere, or flying a demo mission, which is what we're really excited about. And uh, whether it's in space, they're, they're talking about landing on the moon, they're talking about landing on Mars, they're talking about, uh, or, or a space demo. So we're hoping we can get that mission uh, funded and going here pretty soon. Uh, get it? The, the other thing, while, while I guess I'm killing time, is, is I wanted to rant a little about, about the phobia of radiation for, for uh, <laughs> and I, I assume you guys, I, I just cannot believe how, how bad it is. When I saw the uh, Science Channel, uh, did you see the Science Channel special that, that uh, uh, Robert was in, you know, he had some good comments, but they were talking about how space is a seething cauldron of lethal radiation. And it's like, and all these quotes and like how it kills all the organic matter. And, and a lot of people push that because it might push their programs, uh, either for faster transit times or... Uh, or just health physics. So we just need to, uh, I mean, I did a little study uh, where I, I just, I, you know, you calculate uh, an astronaut going to Mars, his chances of cancer go down, obviously, because there's so many acute events that might kill him before he might develop cancer, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, if, but it's true. I mean, <laughs> so, so it, it, I mean, because all the things say they're going to, you know, it. Basically, NASA won't accept more than a 5% increase in the chance of developing cancer over your lifetime, which is insane for somebody going to Mars, especially since you know, cancer is getting more curable anyway. And, and if it happened after your back, I'd still be happy. Uh, so anyway, uh, th so this is our team. Uh, uh, myself, Pat McClure from LANL, uh, Mark Gibson from Glenn Research Center, and Lee Mason from... Uh, from uh, NASA headquarters. And so this is a concept of the kilopower reactors on Mars. Uh, four of them, all you really see there is a radiator in the Stirling system. And this is really where this all got started. Uh, it was actually John Cassani from JPL that actually really got us looking at uh, small reactors. Uh, and then, uh, then we started taking it towards human exploration. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is show a video uh, and hopefully this works. If it doesn't, we'll go on. But uh, uh, see if it plays. Yeah, this looks good. All right, so this is a video NASA put together that we, we co-produced with them that uh, talks about the project. It's a few minutes, and then I'll go on after that. There's no sound yet, but it should be soon. Yep. NASA is advancing an existing technology to enable future space exploration of the solar system. With plans to expand human missions to Mars and science exploration of the outer planets, the need for reliable power becomes essential. Space-qualified nuclear reactors are one technology that can provide for safe and reliable power for many of these missions. Nuclear power in space is not new. These clips from the 1960s provide a window into the past a U.S. program was put into place that developed and flew the world's first space reactor. Before the reactor is turned on, that is, prior to fission starting, the reactor fuel is very safe 
and only mildly radioactive. A joint venture between NASA and the Department of Energy is underway to develop a new space reactor that meets a range of exploration missions. The reactor, called Kilopower, can deliver a range of 1 to 10 kilowatts of electricity. That is enough to power anything from one toaster to an entire household. Kilopower will be tested in the Nevada desert at the Nevada National Security Site. The test has a fissioning reactor deliver heat to Stirling converters. Each converter produces about 100 watts. The goal of the test is to confirm the system's predicted performance. The reactor core is a cylinder of enriched uranium that is 6 inches in diameter. A beryllium oxide reflector will surround the uranium core. A single rod of boron carbide is used to turn on the reactor. The reactor uses well-established nuclear physics to self-regulate the fission reactions, and this feature eliminates the need for a complicated control system. The reactor uses nuclear fission to produce heat, which is delivered by heat pipes to power generators, known as Stirling converters. A radiator is used to keep the Stirling converters cool. A great deal remains to be done but with the successful completion of the nuclear test in Nevada, NASA is coming ever closer to the reality of a space-qualified nuclear reactor. Over the coming years, the reliability and safety of Kilopower will be tested to assure that when the new era of space exploration begins, all systems will be a go. All right, so... Now it's a little less exciting as I get back to me talking. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, so, so what we really have here is, a, uh, is, is about as simple of the nuclear reactor as you can make, which is the whole idea. I mean, 40 years of failed programs uh, and no advancement in nuclear technology whatsoever. I mean, even, even the Department of Energy was formed. I'm getting on my horse, but the Department of Energy was, was formed in the 70s with the Department of Nuclear Energy to advance nuclear reactors and absolutely nothing for, for 40 years. So every reactor the Department of Energy has, uh, except for some new naval reactors, which are the same design, is something that was started by the Atomic Energy Commission in the, in, in the early 60s and 70s. So all it is is, is, a, is a cylinder of uh, uranium, which is about four inches in diameter for this one. Uh, that that uh, when you withdraw a B4C a neutron absorber, it generates fission heat. It goes through heat pipes up to uh, uh, Stirling converters, which convert uh, with, a, in, in this case, about 30% efficiency is what we got. We actually, for the whole system, we got about 25% efficiency. Um, and our losses were pretty high, actually, with thermally, so we can do better than that in space. And then there's, there would be a titanium heat pipe radiator to reject the heat. Uh, for, for, and then the, the, the system we tested was the one kilowatt space size version. It could be used on Mars. But then, then the system we're looking at right now is a, is a, uh, is a 10 kilowatt electric system uh, with there's just more heat pipes in, in a larger radiator and in larger Stirlings, which can be used on, on surface uh, for either uh, the moon or Mars. Uh, the key technology really in this reactor is the heat pipe. Um, and the heat pipe was actually invented at Los Alamos by a guy who wanted to use it for space reactors back in the 60s. Um, and for some reason, nobody ever wanted to adopt it. We'd go to NASA with heat pipe reactor programs, and they'd always pick a pump liquid metal system or a gas-cooled system, and we'd always fail. So we actually went out and just did our own internal demonstration to show that heat pipe reactors could work. And now we're making some great progress. But it. it at the top on this picture, you, you put heat in, you evaporate, in this case, a liquid metal. Vapor pressure drives that uh, liquid metal down to the condenser, where it condenses and gives off at heat. And then you have a capillary wick, uh, some kind of forced uh, uh, capillary mechanism to bring the fluid back. And these are well established. Every laptop, I think, these days has one. It, it, all the gamers know what heat pipes are because they have, they have big ones on their uh, GPUs. Uh, so, uh, why did we pick this design? And, and partially, like I said, it was really just to do something. And this gave us a path to take a few steps. So, the, the key is really the self-regulating uh, characteristics of the physics, 
we made, we made the nuclear physics as simple as we could so that we could predict the test, get approval for the test, and be sure that it was going to work. And the power is so low, there's no measurable nuclear effects, small, small gradients and stresses. Uh, and then we, we love the heat pipe reactor, as I mentioned, you know, no pumped loops, no freeze-thaw issues with, with your whole coolant limit and accumulator. Uh, it's fault tolerant. We can lose several heat pipes and still produce full power. Uh, and the only thing we have to do is really withdraw the control rod uh, to start it up. The control rod is really like a thermostat. It, it's cool how reactors work, and I'll show that on the next slide. Uh, we can use it with uh, existing Stirlings or thermoelectrics. The low-cost testing was obviously huge. You know, we just wanted to go do something. So I'm not going to try to go through this too much. I, I, does the cursor show on the screen? All right, well, anyway, uh, I, what really happens here is, is you have a, have, have a, the reactor has feedback. If it heats up, it's basically going to produce less power. It's going to, the neutron population is going to decrease. So if you ask for more power from the system, if it's operating in steady state, you're going to cool it, right? You're taking more power out. The reactor temperature goes down. This causes less neutrons to leak out of the system, basically. The atoms in the uranium get closer together. And so less neutrons leak out, you get more fission, more power until it heats back up again, and then maybe you get too much power and you generally overshoot a couple of os oscillations. So, uh, so, but in the end, you come to a steady state system that matches the power that the power conversion system wants a and uh, at the same temperature. And so that we don't really, we don't really, we absolutely don't have to control the reactor after it starts up. It's all just, depending on how much power is drawn from the power conversion system, it'll provide it. And if that's nothing, that's nothing. It'll be in a hot standby mode. Um, so it's totally safe from that perspective in that if you lose all your cooling, the reactor just uh, stops producing power. And we, we demonstrated this in our test. It's pretty cool. Uh, Safety is always an issue that comes up um, with uh, reactors. And, uh, the, you know, the reactor before it operates, is totally benign, uh, like some New Mexico dirt, basically. Uh, and so even if the core is fully aerosolized, aerosolized in a launch accident, you know, you're going to have no, you won't even be able to measure the, any radiation dose at the site boundary. Uh, after it fissions, it becomes radioactive. And so our real job is to make sure it doesn't turn on before we want it to, which is an engineering problem. And, and we've also designed this thing to handle any launch accident that the uh, any launch book could throw at us with fires or falling in the ocean or falling in sand. Um, then once you're on the planetary surface or anywhere in space, you know, reliability is what matters, right? I mean, traditional nuclear safety is, is not really important. You don't even have an atmosphere to, to, uh, to um, contaminate if you do, did lose some fission products. So, so I mean, we still deal with uh, safety issues, but reliability is what the astronauts are going to care about. Uh, how big is this thing? Uh, so the core, it depends which one you're talking about. For the, for the core, for the one kilowatt, it's about four inches. And for the uh, 10 kilowatt, it's about six inches across. And the whole reactor with its shielding is about a trash can. And then the radiator we've got in this case about 10 feet up. These are actually designs, what, what the core cross section looks like. Um, the, uh, the, the crusty test, which, which you saw, and I'll talk about a little bit more. The core is four inches across, and there are eight heat pipes. And then the 43 kilowatt thermal, which gives us 10 kilowatts electric, is about six inches across with uh, 24 heat pipes. And we, we could go to higher powers, but what, what we're, again, we just want to keep this as simple as we can. If you're in, if you know anything about nuclear engineering, fuel burnup can cause issues, in, in the, uh, but we've gone with such a low power that we won't get any uh, fuel swelling, uh, cracking, uh, fission gas problems with this fuel. All right, so I, I don't need to go through all this because that, that's what this conference has done for years and years as possible applications of, of technology and, you know, mainly the surface ones. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest now um, uh, in power and space. So we're coming along in a good time, uh, whether it's commercial or government or, or defense, um, and a lot of great things we can do with power. So... So I, we're, we're getting a lot of calls these days. Uh, from our surface power, you know, we've used about on the scale of 100 watts with all of our uh, radioisotope systems and solar systems. 
NASA is now projecting 40 kilowatts of continuously available power uh, for their first human mission. That's, that's where it is right now, but us being in 10 kilowatt uh, intervals or a step size, it's nice because we're flexible to more or less power uh, and some redundancy. You know, eventually we'll want megawatts for settlements in large scale ISRU. Spelled it wrong there. Uh, the uh, uh, um, the uh, Mars surface, as everybody here knows, does present some challenges for solar, which really is what gives us, it makes reactors the best choice uh, in most people's opinions, including NASA. Um, you know, and it, and it comes down to it's really hard in the first place, and then the potential for the dust storms it means you just have to provide so much overcapacity not only for your solar systems, but your ISR production, anything that's making oxygen, it's only gonna be doing it when the sun's out. So everything's gotta be higher capacity and, and to about three or four times as much. So the mass numbers get terrible. The complexity of these huge arrays get terrible. So, it, you know, I, even 10 years ago, NASA was baselining solar. Uh, but once we were able to pull this demonstration off, uh, they're definitely excited about nuclear. How did we get here? Uh, the, uh, so, you know, again, after getting burned, it was basically NASA getting burned by DOE is the short version of the story uh, for, for what was happening. But just the, the programs got too expensive and failed uh, for, for nuclear reactors. And so NASA wasn't even listening to us anymore. And we were all frustrated. Uh, I was going to move on to other stuff, even though I dedicated my life to this. And uh, so, so we needed to find something that could be a attractive and proven really quickly uh, with no money, basically. You know, uh, basically with, with getting favors from people that work at the lab, we ended up getting a, a few hundred K of government internal money, which in the government world is, is nothing. And we pulled off the Duff experiment. Um, and so the, uh, that, that's what really sparked interest. And that's, that's this right here. The, the demonstration using flat top visions or Duff and I do have a Simpsons issue if you start to notice names coming up. Uh, the, uh, the test configuration was, was an existing reactor there. Uh, just the, they, use, they don't run it as a reactor, but it could, it could be a reactor. By reactor, I just mean a, a fission system that can produce power at a steady state or a controlled environment. Um, so we're able to throw a water heat pipe in there and, uh, and put, uh, connect it to some existing Stirling engines and, and make some power, light up a light. And that got, that, you know, that got NASA thinking, oh, we can really do stuff still, because it was, you know, we hadn't done anything real for so long that we all questioned if we could. So that, that was really what opened the door, was us going doing this really simple test. Uh, and here's the complete setup is, you know, it was that, that whole, on the left you have, the flat top critical assembly and you're just looking at a ball of highly oxidized depleted uranium on the outside and then there's HEU on the inside uh, and the Stirling converters. So, so next was Krusty, the kill power reactor using uh, Stirling technology. And uh, so this, this is a reactor that was fully designed, uh, fabricated and tested. The whole works. Uh, you know, for, uh, for less than $20 million in government money, which is still, it, it really showed him, yeah, we can do, we can do a flight system for, for 100 million instead of the billions everybody was talking about. Because we, we did all the technology here. Now, we still have to go do all the safety cases, get, get all the approvals, it's mostly probably paperwork, and, and space qualify, space qualify the Stirling engines. The reactor, there's not much to space qualify, but, but uh, it, it was a huge success. Uh, so we started out with the flight concept we had. We, uh, we, we prototyped, did some mechanical prototyping. Then we did a lot of electrical testing. And that's, that's really, the heat pipe reactor, one of the greatest things about it is you can test out the whole system by just putting heaters where the fuel would be. Because the heat pipes are self-contained units. It's not like you're flowing fuel, I mean, uh, coolant past the, uh, the fuel. So we tested everything out electrically. And that we also use that to help get uh, approvals to run the test. And then we actually uh, demonstrated it where we had a vacuum, uh, the whole sy the system in a vacuum except the reflector, which we lifted up to, uh, to uh, cause the uh, uh, criticality and fission to occur. 
Um, so we have the core, uh, the, the reactor assembly where we put clamps. We basically just heated clamps up, let them uh, compress onto the uh, heat pipe. So something really simple. It can be done on the launch pad. You know, and so uh, it's, you know, wherever we want to assemble this reactor from an ant low perspective, uh, we can do. Uh, so, so a lot of, lot of cool stuff going on. Uh, the, uh, the, um, this middle picture shows the beryllium oxide is the white. That's, that's what really reflects the neutrons to get them back into the fuel to fission. And that's what makes the reactor so safe because there's no material in nature that's a better reflector than this material. So if you get in a LOX accident and, and any configuration that doesn't ha isn't surrounded by this material is not gonna, not gonna produce fissions. Uh, so then the, the final stuff, the, uh, the test, we did a lot of tests. I'm gonna, I, I always run late, so I'm just gonna go through some of this. A really cool one here is a test where we proved the, the feedback without producing much power. Um, and in, in, the, in the top, you see the reactor temperature and, and the red is the fission power. So we, 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 um, we increase the power and then we, we just let the reactor coast after we've in, uh, inserted reactivity. It's kind of technical, but, but you can see that even at this, this low power, uh, the reactor just settled in at, at its passive heat loss, which is 100 watts, and the temperature settled at, at 400 degrees C. Uh, here's the full power run, and there's, we, we ran this thing through, uh, through every possible transient or off-normal scenario. We figured the reactor might encounter just to show the reactor itself is tolerant to anything you could throw at it from a, uh, from a uh, failure or overpower of the power conversion system. And so in the, in the, uh, near the middle, the, the, the ovals that are vertically longer, that's where we changed the power removal from the Stirling engines and showed that the reactor put out more power. And across the top in that left middle side, you see the reactor temperature staying pretty constant. Then we, then we had some transients who removed the control and showed the temperature change. Then we did some transients where we moved all cooling and showed the reactor just heats up about 20 degrees, comes back down to its nominal temperature and produces no power or the power equal to the passive losses. Uh, this is a closer look at the effect of moving the control rod. Everything was beautiful. I mean, this, this data was better than we could have dreamed and the reactor performed better. The heat pipes instantly responded. I mean, it was amazing. You, 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 change the core temperature and up at the top, you see it in like less than a second back and forth. Heat pipes are, are such a good heat transfer mechanism. Uh, we failed a, one heat pipe on the side, removing power from it and showed we could measure that we measured the temperature changes and everything looked just as we expected. So what would we do in that full power run? We demonstrated startup stability, steady state performance. Uh, we demonstrated the reactor self-regulation, which is big because if you, if you had to, uh, qualify a reactor control system for a mission that's a big cost and a lot of, lot of effort. Plus, it can be competing with the power conversion control system. So that really makes this simple. Uh, we've demonstrated fault tolerance either to failed sterlings or, uh, or failed uh, heat pipes um, and, and demonstrated the ability to remain after it operated for 28 hours, cut off the power and uh, no overheat, nothing. The reactor just sit there for 20 years waiting for somebody to take power from it. And it'll just sit there at 800 degrees C at, at very low power. And if, some, if the Stirling engines happen to turn back on, if you get them back on, it, the reactor will start producing power again. It, it's pretty amazing, actually. Uh, uh, so first reactor, in, in, a new fission reactor concept in the US in 40 years. I think that was big for the whole nuclear community. Uh, lots of experience and data demonstrated the passive performance. The key really for NASA is we showed nuclear is not going to break the bank. Uh, that, that we did all of this for less than 20 million. It's very hard to conceive why it would cost for 100, more than 100 for a space system. I'm sure a contractor would figure that out, but, but, but you know, at least, uh, and demonstrated, uh, you know, that, that uh, we've got something ready now for, for, for space. Uh, and so we're working on a mission, and NASA's on bridge funding now. Uh, yeah, but you know the leading candidate right now is is to land, put the reactor on a lunar lander. We're not excited about that, only because 
we'd rather just put it in space and operate it and have to rely on a lander getting us down there where it might fail. Um, I, I mean, I, of course, I, like all you, think we should be going to the Mars, but I'd rather have a NASA that's serious and actually going to do something on the moon than, than one that just gives lift services to Mars. You know, so, you know, you, that's, that's, if we actually do this, if they actually put a reactor on Mars, I mean, moon, it'll be great. But if we waste time and never do that, then why, why'd we bother? Uh, so yeah, the, on a moon base uh, is, is right now uh, the plan, but it's not a final plan. And I always get in trouble for speaking for NASA anyway. So it's like, I, I, <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, it's, that's the current plan, but it's, it's nothing really set in stone. All right, thanks. Thank you, sir. Power distribution. Do I, I walk over to this and I plug in my extension cord and I go to work. That's correct, right? Is there a more efficient way to distribute power from this than an extension cord? Uh, I, there, I'm sure there is, but that's, we're not looking at anything beyond that, you know, for these first missions. So, and I wouldn't be the guy that would be in that sort of technology anyway. But it's a good question. Um, I've been oh, following this program for quite a while, and it's very... Oh, where are we? Oh. Here. Okay, hey. <laughs> uh, I've been following this for a while. It's, it's awesome. I think you guys are doing absolutely brilliant work. Uh, but the thing I'm most impressed with is this, does, this thing just doesn't seem to die uh, because of the low enriched uranium. Have you guys figured out how long this thing could last? Oh, well, yeah, the reactor... I, it's even a silly question for the reactor because... The reactor could produce full power for 200 years without any, without burn-up problem, without nuclear. So it's it's all it's all going to be on the Sterling technology, which which is obvious. How long it lasts? If we put thermoelectrics on it, you know, we get, you know, four times less power, but maybe a little more reliability. But even thermoelectrics these days are kind of hard to find and expensive. During these Sterling engines, they're 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 spitting out for other reasons. So. Uh, that's, that's the biggest thing. And as far as the reactor is concerned, you know, corrosion within the heat pipe, if we don't do good uh, QA when we fill it up, you know, could be a lifetime issue. But, but the reactor is so benign that it's, I mean, we've done that all, this all intentionally to make this thing as bulletproof as possible from, from any naysayers or from actual technology problems. Uh, question about your umbrella. Okay. Um, with 10 kilowatts, you're putting out about 30 kilowatts of heat off the umbrella? Yeah. The radiator. How do you match that with the direct sunlight ingression? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's designed to put out that power with the sun on it. Um, you know, it, it's operating at, at, at about 420 Kelvin, I believe. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's oversized. It'll, you'll get more power out when you're, the sun's not shining on it. Yeah, I'm sure you're aware that the space shuttles were cooled by uh, heat pipe radiators in the payload bay doors. That's how the mm -hmm. whole thermal control system worked. Yeah. And then I was involved in heat pipe tests of those radiators. Oh, cool. And at a, at a point later on, they decided to switch to two-phase flow heat pipes, which are more efficient. Have you looked into two-phase flow heat pipes? Oh, they are, they are two-phase flow heat pipes. Oh, they are. Oh, That's okay. right. And the, actually, the same guys who developed the Sterling engines are the guys for NASA that are developing the next generation of titanium water heat pipes for, for NASA. So, yes. Uh, I know you can't go too far into this, but... Uh... Your control mechanism, when you lose heat removal, somebody shears off the radiator or whatever, is that something to do with the control rod? Is that on sort of a dead man mechanism to go back in if uh, the reactor heats up? Or? No, it's, it's not going to. That was, it was really hard to explain, but that's, it, it's just, the reactor heats up a little bit, more neutrons leak out, so it just keeps producing less and less power <laughs> till it gets to the, back to the temperature it wants, and it'll, it'll come to that steady state power, whatever, ever power is being removed. So how well we insulate it will basically determine what happens. So we don't need to, the only reason we'd ever need to move the uh, control rod in is if we wanted to permanently shut down. If, if, uh, if the, you're gonna have a, still have a little bit of radiation there uh, when, it's, when it's simmering at it, it basically zero power and standby 
And if you want to go up and work on it, you, you, you could throw the control, control rod in to totally shut it down. Okay, I think you answered my other one. The one thing that could wear out would be the sterling, since they've got the mechanical parts, the pistons. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll probably have those on wing nuts. You could just go up and replace them in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it'll be really nice when there's astronauts there for sure. Uh, you know, we a lot. I, I've doing I've done a lot of work just determining, activating the surroundings and how long it would take for astronauts to go up and work in this thing. And it's really it's it's only a couple days till it gets down to the background radiation after you shut it down. And if it's an emergency, you can go up. You could go up and operate it like. What's the dust boat or whatever? <laughs> you could go up and work on it while it's uh, while it's operating and uh, and uh, and try to fix it. All right, thanks.